beginning of this. Okay, getting all set up here. Really good. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. So, from March 16 to 19, just a couple of weeks ago, I was one. I was one of 200 people on a pilgrimage. The pilgrimage was called Reckoning Together, a Reconstructionist Pilgrimage Towards Racial Justice. Reconstructing Judaism, our movement, worked on this trip for a very, a very long time, over two years. And I knew I wanted to be a part of it as soon as I knew it was going to happen. What? There were Reconstructionist Jews, a few non-Reconstructionist people who made up the group, including a number of rabbis, cantors, Jews of color, RRC students, Reconstructing Judaism staff, Rabbi Dr. Deborah Waxman, who is the head of our movement and our college, board chair Seth Rosen, and members of many Reconstructing Judaism synagogues across the country, 200 people. There's a, there's a lot of Reconstructionist Jews. <laughs> it was great. It's difficult for me to state just how meaningful this trip was to me. And, but I do wanna demonstrate a little bit about it, tell you a little bit about it, and hopefully you'll get some idea. Um, I'm happy to take questions, a couple of questions when I finish and uh, I'll be happy to stay on Zoom and in the room at the end of the service if people have more questions they want to ask me. So we met, we, everybody met in Atlanta and set the expectations for the group. We got, we're given some directions, some instructions. We had, that was a Thursday night. Um, the next morning, we headed out to Montgomery on four buses. Montgomery is the capital of Alabama. It's a, actually a lovely city. I, I was surprised. It's 200,000 people, very nice place, but there's a very dark history of racism and injustice there. With the leadership of Brian Stevenson, who you may know as the author of Just Mercy, he, he created the Equal Justice Initiative, which is composed of two sites plus their own offices and research facilities. And we went to both of the sites. They were just incredibly moving. The first one was the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. It's this beautiful park-like setting that has several different parts. It's dedicated mostly to lynchings, to, to people who were killed in lynchings over the years that that occurred. Um, there are a couple of beautiful, beautiful sculptures throughout the grounds. But the main focus of it is this big pavilion that has hundreds, maybe thousands of these metal square boxes hanging from the ceiling. And on each of those boxes is the county and state where a lynching has been documented. And then at the bottom of each box is the names of the people who were lynched and the date. Um, in some cases, they didn't know the name, so they just put unknown. But this goes on for quite a while, and you can walk all through them back and forth, and wow. it, it, it is just really unbelievable. And then there are other parts of the National Memorial that have other um, plaques, tell stories. The stories were just really incomprehensible to those of us living in Philadelphia. We, we just don't know from a lot of this. And it was incredible. So we stayed there about an hour and a half. And then after that, we went to the Legacy Museum, which is also part of the e equal, just, equal Justice Initiative. And it's a beautiful museum. It's only about 10 years old. And um, you can't take photos in there, which is why I, don't, I decided not to do photos tonight. Um, but the museum really tells the story of Blacks in America, starting with coming over on the slave ships. And there's an exhibit at the very beginning when you first go in that shows a video of just a very turbulent ocean depicting what, the, you know, when they came over on the slave ships in these holds below deck 
coming through these turbulent oceans. Then there's another room that shows the, the many, many different faces depicted in sculptures of the slaves who came over. They look different, they had different bandages on their faces and they're all kind of coming out of the earth in this big room, it was incredible. Then you go into a big room that really outlines the history of blacks in America, starting with slavery, going to emancipation, reconstruction, um, Jim Crow, and then mass incarceration today. So it describes all of that and how it flows. But then the rest of the museum, which is self-guided, we just walked around at our own pace. The rest of the museum tells you more detail about each of those periods in history. And um, some of it's interactive. You can hear, you could pick up a phone and hear an inmate telling what it's like to be incarcerated today. Another very moving part of that museum is a wall. It's a big wall. It goes from, I would say, I don't know, maybe it's 25, 30 feet, maybe more. And it's got shelves from floor to ceiling, maybe eight shelves. And all on those shelves are glass jars about, let me see for the people in Zoom, maybe this high with soil. And the soil was collected at the known sites of lynchings. And on each jar is the name of the person that was lynched at that site and the date. To see all of them lined up was just really unbelievable. And they're still collecting more because um, this is an ongoing project. And what the Equal Justice Initiative is, is doing, one of the things they're doing is they're trying to get local counties around the country to acknowledge that lynching, the injustice and that lynchings took place in their county. And if a, if a, a county is willing to do that, they get the help of the EJI, Equal Justice Initiative. They get a duplicate of the metal boxes that were hanging from the ceiling. They get a duplicate to display in their own community, as well as a metal plaque, you know, marker that they can use. And the point of it is to really get local communities to own up to what happened and not try to sweep it under the rug, so to speak, anymore. Yeah. So needless to say, it was incredibly moving. From there, we moved on to the Rosa Parks Museum, which is a small museum. Um, I, you know, Our tour guides that were with us the whole trip led the tour for us through the Rosa Parks Museum. I don't know how it's usually done, if that's the way it is. But um, I learned a lot more about the Rosa Parks story than I knew, that it wasn't just that she wouldn't get up and give her seat away. There was more to it than that. And the biggest room in the museum, they have a replica of the bus, of the buses that were in Montgomery in, that, in those days. And um, it, so it was like half a bus. It was like, you see the whole side of a bus oh, and it's wow. cut in half. And then behind that, I'm gonna need somebody. Okay, and then um, behind the half the bus, you see an animated depiction of what happened on that, th that okay. famous day. And it's really well done. Like you see it through the windows and you see what the bus driver did and you see how the other passengers treated her and whatnot. It's, it, it's really a, a small, but lovely, lovely, well done museum. So that was another thing we learned about. And then we learned about the Montgomery bus boycotts and the um, impact that had on the community. Oh, it's a lot, a lot. So that was all the first day. No. <laughs> we stayed in Montgomery that night. And the next morning we headed out for Selma. And we took the road that was the, the route that they walked in the Selma to Montgomery walk. Only we did it in the reverse order. We were going from Montgomery to Selma. So we went to Selma. And there we talked to a woman who was there on Bloody Sunday. She was 11 years old at the time. But her older sister was more heavily involved and actually walked 
the whole five days of the completed walk from Selma to Montgomery. Wow. And she told us all about what happened. And we had learned some of it on the bus on the way over. Um, it was very, very interesting. And to hear it firsthand from someone, you know, it's it's kind of like the Holocaust, how there's a lot of talk about how we, we have to interview all the survivors. We have to get all the stories down because they're not going to be around much longer. Well, it's the same way with these people who were there on Bloody Sunday and who marched from Selma to Montgomery. They might be a little younger than the Holocaust survivors in some cases, in some cases, maybe not. But it's really important to hear their stories so we know what happened. So we heard from her. And the interesting thing was the church that they took us to, where she spoke to us, had two entrances, which we all gasped. There was an entrance in the front facing the road for whites and another entrance on the side of the church facing the parking lot for blacks. Uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. So we did that and we heard the first hand account of Bloody Sunday and, and a lot, what a lot of people forget is that there were actually three walks across that bridge. The first one was Bloody Sunday and then they turned back because they could see they couldn't make it through. And then um, I think just a matter of days later, there was a second one. And again, they saw that the police were waiting for them. The troops were waiting for them at the bottom of the bridge. So they turned back again. And then they applied for a permit, which they were granted. And two weeks later was the full walk from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights. Um, so we had that talk and then they drove us to the bridge, to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is I know ingrained in a lot of our minds, the, the image of it. And we got off the buses, those who wanted to, and we walked across in silence, which is the custom there. Um, ironically, as we were walking across, a funeral was coming the other way. And it was just, it, it, was, it was really something. There were also a couple of people coming across the bridge in the opposite direction that honked their horn at us and gave us thumbs up, you know, to show their support for what we were doing, which was nice. And then at the end of the bridge, there's another, there's a small park with different plaques and sculptures, a very nice one of John Lewis. Um, and that was, that was that. So then we left Selma and went to Birmingham. So Birmingham, we had lunch at a reform, I think a reform synagogue, let us use their community, their social room, big social room. So we had a catered lunch there. And at the end of the lunch, a bishop, a black Baptist bishop, Calvin Woods Sr., who is currently 90 years old, came to talk to us. So he's a former president of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Council sorry, Conference. Leadership. Conference, yeah. sorry. And he, we were warned in advance what he would do. Like he was going to pray with us and he wanted us to sing with him and dance with him, people that wanted to get up. And he'd be doing some, some Jesus preaching and just go along with it. And, you know, he was amazing. He was really amazing. And he did everything we were told in advance he was going to do. Like he wanted us to sing with him, dance a little with him and talk to us. And he's one of these very spiritual bishops who in the middle of his talking to us, all of a sudden he let out what we would say in Yiddish, like a shri, like a shriek, a loud shriek in the middle. And that was the spirit, the, the spirit taking him over him. Wow. He, he was a trip, but he was really interesting. Really interesting. He also was there on Bloody Sunday and talked about it. Uh, so that was quite an experience. Then we headed back to Atlanta. Oh, uh, before we went back to Atlanta, we drove past the 16th Street Baptist Church, which is everybody's nodding, the church where those four young girls, those four little girls were killed, which was just, we didn't go in. I think either you're not allowed in or we couldn't go in at that time, but we did drive past and they have a separate door to commemorate what happened there. So we did that. Then it was back to Atlanta. So every day we debriefed, we prayed together. We had Shabbat services either in person or on the bus. Each bus did their own thing. We had talks from some of the Jews of color who were with us and what this meant to them to be there and what it means for them to be in community with the reconstructionist movement. Um, 
which is which is very moving. And our movement does have a big push, a big initiative in this area right now. So Sunday morning was the morning I was looking forward to. We got to go to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, before we went to the church, we went across the street from the church. And I didn't know any of this before I went, is the original church, the church they're using now is new and modern, is beautiful, was the original church, which we couldn't go in. But next to it, they have built this plaza where Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Coretta Scott King, are now buried. They're above ground tombs. It's beautiful. It was really nicely done. He was originally not buried there. He was buried in a family plot elsewhere, but they were worried they were having some problems and whatever, and they decided to build this plaza for the two. And there's a beautiful eternal a flame there and engraved into the concrete to this plaza are some of his famous quotes. Mm. It's really, really nice. So then we walked across the street to the church. Now, I admit, I am a big fan of Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock. I worked on his campaigns. I just think he's fabulous. So I was so excited about seeing him. And sure enough, we walked in the lobby and there he was, 10 feet away from me. I was so excited, but he was busy talking. I didn't bother him. So it just so happened, it was the 137th anniversary of Ebenezer Baptist. And what they did for the service was they got together with a reform, big reform synagogue in Atlanta that they do things together. The two choirs joined together and sang together the whole service Ooh. was beautiful. But the funny ironic thing is that the rabbi from the synagogue did the preaching that morning and he gave the sermon. So while I didn't go to Atlanta to hear a sermon from a, from a rabbi, um, it, was, it was wonderful. He was very, very good. And Reverend Warnock did speak, and he was kind of the host of the service. He kind of led the service. And it was just very moving. I mean, I love going to, to Black churches from time to time, and the music is so moving. And also with us struggling with our technology all the time, they have technology. Woo, do they have technology. It's amazing. Um, so we sat up in the balcony and they welcomed us. And I actually sat with my doing okay time wise. You're kind of at the end of it. So. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I'm at the end. Yeah, that's good. Um, I sat with Rabbi Sean Zevitt, who some of you know, who's a friend of mine. And we sat together through the service. I was so happy. Anyway, that was, that was the church service and it, it was beautiful. So people keep asking me, what was the highlight of the trip? And truthfully, I can't say there was one highlight because there was so much and everything we did was intense, moving, thought provoking. I couldn't help but compare the black history that we were seeing and learning about to the Holocaust. Now I did not have any family members in the Holocaust. My family was all here by then, but I, with all I've learned and studied, I, um, I, I couldn't help, it just kept popping up in my mind to compare it. And that's not to say that one was worse or one was not as bad or, or whatever. There were similarities. And the biggest similarity I walked away with was that in both things, in, in the black history of America and the Holocaust, people were treated inhumanely. They were not treated like people and not awarded the dignity they deserved. And that was the biggest similarity. Um, and I carry that with me because I think we have to work harder for racial justice in this country. So um, that's that. The things that have, have been and continue to be denied to Blacks and other people of color are clear markers in the understanding of the situation we're in today. Uh, in our city, in other cities, with poverty, poor education, holes, gaps in the opportunities to accumulate wealth, um, and unjust policing, certainly, and job inequality. So my goal after having taken this trip is to commit myself to be able to do more work towards the solutions of these problems, whether it be political activism or working through power. And I think anything that we can do through our engagement with power will help contribute to this. So I'm gonna, I know, I know I'm getting the hook. 
So I'm going to hold off on questions, but you're welcome to stay on and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so you're much. You're welcome. To clap for you. No. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Really and truly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.